housekeeping things is everyone's mute, everyone's mic is disabled at this time. We will turn the mics back on at the end for Q&A or you're welcome to put chat, uh, your questions in a chat and we'll we'll have time at the end to address them. Um, so with that, I will pass it off to Tiffany. If you want to go ahead and share your screen and get started, that would be amazing. I hate to ask it of you. I know we talked about this. Um, would you mind sharing since you did manage to get it downloaded? And the reason being, I've had wonderful glitches in Teams all day. And somewhere around the time I share, I disappear. Yeah, not a problem at all. I will share the screen again. And then, yeah, just let me know when it's time to advance the slide. Sure. OK. Uh, and if yep. you could put it in slideshow mode, is that possible? Yeah, so it looks like it's in slideshow mode here, but. Is that better? Sure. That. Absolutely works. So hi everyone. I'm Tiffany Turner from uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Thank you, Jacob, for inviting me to be here and talk about the role that sportsmen and women have in climate change. Um, I think if you go to the next slide, sportsmen and women in climate change are not regularly thought of uh, in the first or in the sentence, the same sentence. Um, I'm not seeing the next slide, Jacob. It's on my screen. It might just be a little. I think, slow. yeah, maybe you. Sometimes when you go presenter mode, it oh. goes over there. So if we need to do it in just regs PowerPoint, we can. Let me see. Thank you all for your patience. Sorry for the technical issues. OK, does that look better? I see you. <laughs> see me, OK. This is fully my fault mm -hmm. for having a meeting backed okay. up to this exact. <laughs> we'll just stay there. That one's perfect. We'll just. Is that. Hey, that's okay. you're rolling. And I advanced the slide. Now. You did. Did the slide advance? It did. Maybe we have a solution. OK, we did. Thank Me you, too. Jacob. Thanks. So, yeah, we are maybe seen as unlikely advocates. You're not expecting to see sportsmen and women talking about climate change, I think. But um, it's a bit of a misnomer in, in that or a misconception because we are deeply impacted by climate change, spending days and weeks at a time afield and experiencing all the things that people are often reading about and making that connection to climate change for, for hunters and anglers is what TRCP is striving to do. While they are experiencing um, all of the impacts and effects of climate change, we, we wanna make sure that they're able to, to connect the dots. So we have 41 hunting, fishing, and outdoor recreation, land order and conservation groups that all decided to come together to advance climate solutions. We regularly partner with our um, partner. We we have we are a partnership organization. That is our, our bread and butter. We take the P very seriously at TRCP. And so we have pulled together, I think, 63 partner organizations at this point. And we we talk about policy and how we can advance different policy um, initiatives at the federal level. And climate is our most recent added center because there was a realization around 2008, and then everyone was forced to kind of, there were some political levers pulled where they, they stopped talking about it for a minute when the, they produced Season's End, if anyone read those, and Beyond Season's End. Um, and then there were some bills, and they didn't go through, and everybody got scared. So around 2020, or 2018 actually, people started getting back together and saying, we got to do something about this. And in 2020, they put out a climate statement that was focused on nature-based solutions. There's lots of solutions that are out there for climate change. Um, and I've read, we've got them all. We just need to use them. But nature-based solutions are the solutions that make most sense for our coalition because that's where we're credible. That's where we know 
what the what the actual actions are and how they work and the science. So putting together the statement, putting together different um, conversations with Congress, and then we started thinking, so we're leading this, but is anyone following? And that's when we decided to do a little bit of uh, opinion research. So go to the next slide. And so in 2022, you can go to the next one, we conducted a survey among 603 sportsmen and women. And when you think about that number, it feels really small, but it's actually pretty um, in keeping with the numbers you would expect for a national poll. It's 800 to 1,000, that should say, um, respondents is what you would want for a typical national poll that's not a population subgroup. So we did pretty well. And then to build those questions, we actually had a small focus group, which they called a qual board, an online focus group, which was a fun thing to do. I <laughs> I thought focus groups in my mind were like where everyone comes together in this small room where there's you're being watched and it's glass behind you and they ask you to watch a commercial. But now with technology, everyone was coming forward from across the US and pinging each other. And it became very like a social element where we took people on a journey of thinking about their role in the environment and their role in the U.S. and eventually into their conversation of their role in, in climate change. And we used their answers to, to build out the survey questions. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you'll see with the broad survey, we were able to be pretty well representative, not only of our community, but pretty well with um, what you would expect for a, a national poll. We are heavily weighted on the gender issue of 62% uh, male versus female, but and, and then more heavily weighted on the ethnicity, white versus total non-white, but we also thought that was pretty representative of the hunting and fishing community. We were happy to see that we um, were pretty well representative with ages and with parties and then the rest made just it made good sense for what you would see for hunting and fishing as a community and we'll go into our key findings so if you go down so the first thing that you should know that we that we came out with was that there uh that three quarters almost three quarters 72 percent say that climate change is happening um, and that may not seem groundbreaking, but it's actually where America is. America is at around 74%, one of the longest running polls with uh, the Yale Climate Change Communication Program has tracked the U.S. at 74%. Other polls have checked, tracked the U.S. around three quarters. And so that was really nice to see that the hunting and fishing community, we may feel really special, and we are, uh, but we're also just like the rest of America in saying, yeah, we think climate change is happening. And if you go to the next one, of that three quarters or so saying that it's it's human causes, there's still some work to be done when it comes to bringing this community along around the natural cause conversation. And so that means we have some communicating to do. And the next slide. We wanted to ask people, what are they seeing? So that was kind of the thing that I was I was wondering. It's like, do they understand what climate change is? And then also just what are they seeing out there? So a majority saw an increase in um, weird or variable weather. They saw declining populations of fish and wildlife, an increased number of fleas, and ticks related to diseases, and um, river streams and lakes hurt by drought, and maybe some fish species moving out of their traditional areas. And then we started to get a little lower numbers as we as we moved down to the rest. But there was no, there not, there weren't any high numbers in decrease. And that was another important takeaway: is that if people weren't saying increase, they might be saying no change, but they definitely weren't saying we're having a decrease in fish populations declining. And the next one. So then we started to map what people were saying that they were noticing. And um, it kind of made sense, right? So in the West, fish are be being affected by higher water temperatures. We know around that same time there were a lot of river closures in the summer. The frequency of fire or smoke of, from wildfires 
absolutely a lot of wildfires in the west in the northeast we know the data supports increased numbers of fleas and ticks people are seeing that but then in the midwest and the south we had the highest report back of weird or variable weather and the other thing i took away from this was was almost like a reverse nimbyism or another take on nimbyism that you're not really seeing it it being climate change if it's not in your backyard so this is what this is what people are seeing and this is what climate change is to them because that's what's in their backyard and most recently in dc where i am and then a lot of the east coast we got to say frequency of fire or smoke from wildfires and I think if we were to do the poll again, we'd see that uptick in numbers, um, at least on the East Coast, where that's a thing that's happening for us that I don't think people expected. Pretty sure no one thought there's going to be some wildfire in Canada that's going to turn the skies orange. Um, so the, the these numbers, I think, will continue to change and continue to get a little bit more realistic, I think, as unfortunately more emergencies or events happen that that prompt people to think about it. Um, next slide, Jacob. So the other thing that we we asked was, OK, we know that you've said weird weather. We know that you've said other things that you're seeing. But are you what are you connecting as being due to climate change? And the number one was weird or variable weather. So that was good because it's not, it wasn't a way out of having the climate change conversation. It was, we're having this weird weather and I recognize that it's connected to climate change. Rivers, lakes, and streams are hurt by drought, fish affected by higher water temperatures, and those are all above the majority. And then the numbers get a little bit lower when you get into natural disasters and, and frequency of smoke from, from wildfires. There's, there's a lot of different impacts that are out there that are happening that are climate change related or being worsened by climate change. And th seeing this data come in, we were able to confirm for ourselves, okay, we have a job to do to connect the science to what's happening on the ground for people because there are things that are clear. There are things that are clear regionally. And we'd like to make sure that the rest of it is clearer and not just regionally, not just a nimbyism. Next slide. Um, we also asked whether or not people would say that climate change is going to affect their ability to hunt and fish or their family. And we asked them whether it's going to affect them or it is affecting them now, it's going to be in the next five years, the next 20 years, the next generation, or they just think it's going to have no effect at all. And so there are 29% of people in the hunt and fish community that say it's it's not going to affect their their ability to hunt and fish at all, and 25% say it's not going to affect their family. Um, that kind of tracks with again, Yale's uh, been doing these these surveys for a really long time. I think since like 2008, maybe uh, tracking annual of how people feel. I think they've seen a in their Six Americas study a pretty regular 30% of Americans are either not sure or disengaged and and so we saw that here again another point that hunt and fish is special but also just american um the ability to hunt and fish now five years in the next 20 years that's the majority of the people saying in the next 20 years between now and 20 years from now the majority of hunt, hunter, hunters and anglers are saying uh this is real and i have to think about it and one way I thought about this, because at first I was like, God, 20 years, people, can you not see what's happening? Um, one of the ways I thought about it is if anyone out there has kids, um, and if anyone out there has a kid who's about to graduate high school or is even five years old, like my first one, um, it goes by like in a blink. It's a snap and they're, they're out. And so if... The tracking makes sense on who is reporting to this survey, then these are people who have kids who are um, young or either about to get out of the house or are in their, they're in retirement. They know that 20 years is fast. And so that just reaffirms for me that it's, they, that it's not 
far away that it's real. And the other thing, the other way to take it is that's 10 Congresses, 10 sessions of Congress. And when it comes to the farm bill, when we want to talk about action and policy potential, um, that's four farm bills. And I would imagine anyone in, in Congress or even anyone in your current role now, and you look at your, you know, your retirement, mine's still 20 years away. Um, there's a lot of work that can be done in those 20 years, a lot of solutions, a lot of partnership. So there's a lot of opportunity. Next slide. So we know climate change is not the only thing that is threatening our hunt, our, our hunt fish opportunities, our wildlife, our habitat. So we wanted to know what are people seeing as a threat? And so habitat being broken up by development and industry was the number one thing seen as threat. And then pollution. And then we dug down into pollution. Climate change was a component of that, but also it kind of references pollution is a big catch-all and it's something that people are more comfortable with because there's a longer history of talking about pollution, whether it's air or water. Um, disease. So CWD is a really big focus for my organization. And um, I think that anyone who's a deer hunter and or a, in the in that space if they're they're talking about moose dying from from being overloaded by fleas and ticks i think you can't hunt moose in minnesota anymore um somebody check me on that but i feel like um doug beard told me that recently their disease is obviously recognized as a threat to our wildlife and to our habitat and um, that is only going to get worse as temperatures change, as habitat is threatened. Um, so climate change is a contributor to each one of these things, even if it's not the number one. And then roads and highways across habitat or migration routes. Um, and so there's, that's obviously, a, that's a focus for our organization outside of climate, but it's really important to, to note those issues and how they overlap. Next slide, Jacob. So then we started talking about, okay, we we, we are not, we want to know what you feel about climate, but we also want to know what how you feel about some solutions. And like I said, nature-based solutions is the the credible space for our, us and our partners. And we also know conservation strategies are climate solutions. And so we wanted to see kind of where where our community was on that thinking. And 86% said that restoring wetlands and coastal areas that and we didn't shy away from talking about storing carbon but then also talked about the other elements right wildlife habitat and resilience to storms um, and pollutants 86 percent support policies that um, that would restore wetlands and coastal areas 84 percent for restoring forest prairies and gas land, grasslands 76 for having a national goal and i'll read this of conserving and restoring 30 percent of land and inland waters in America and 30% of its ocean areas by the year 2030. Um, that's 30 by 30, just spelled out and not said 30 by 30, because that had a, has a little bit of, um, especially at the time in 2022, some political um, questions, right? Like, will we turn people off if we say 30 by 30? But if we explain what 30 by 30 is, do people support it? Yes, and 76% say they support financial incentives that encourage farmers to adopt regenerative practices and climate smart practices. Um, this this is just overwhelming majority of the, the stuff that we know and love, the stuff that you're doing in your agencies. Um, hunters and anglers are all for it. And of course that makes sense, right? But we needed to understand with the climate lens on it, do you understand? Do you support it? And help us talk about this with, with Congress and with states. Next slide. So I, on the next couple of slides, I just kind of broke it down as a confirmation of this wasn't, you know, a fully liberal pushed um, reason why we got to, to 86%, right? This was across parties. You see the next one. that it was across hunt and fish versus both. So the numbers 
are are not too different depending on our hunt and fish groups. And the reason we did this is um, oftentimes hunt only groups are more right of center, and we wanted to make sure that that we weren't being overly heavily weighted by the fish only group. And next slide. And then we we again sliced it between whether or not you believe climate change is happening and you or you don't believe it. Do you still support this? And we saw that we still have each strategy strongly supported or the majority supporting um, these things that we called out help as climate solutions. And next slide. So what it all comes down to is how we communicate. So right now when you say you see hot and dry or weird weather, that's what people are associating most with with climate change. We know we know that means that there's work to do around connecting the dots for for hunters and anglers so that there's there's more understanding around what they're seeing and what's happening. You go to the next slide. Um, the key takeaways were for, between the qual board, so the small focus group, and then the national poll. We saw it over and over again, and I think we've seen it in other initiatives outside of um, even climate change that people people really react better to solutions rather than problems. And it's very specifically seen in climate change in that we've heard the doom and gloom around climate change, around us hitting our, our um, no, points of no return. And those things may be true. Sometimes truth turns people away. And it's not that we're we're trying to say, don't tell the truth. It's just that people, People are tired, especially after COVID, of feeling all the problems of the world and feeling like they don't have a role and feeling like there's nothing they can do. So showing people solutions really worked. And the most uh, pointed version of that was in the call board or in the focus group, we showed some videos. And like I said, we took people through a three-day journey. During that journey, just earlier in the day, um, someone had said, no, I just don't believe this stuff works. I mean, eh. And what do conservation groups have to do with it anyway? There's a couple of comments that were put in there. Um, they know they're being watched, but, you know, people, people um, still <laughs> give freely of their opinions, which I appreciated. But then we showed them a video, and it was only about five minutes. And it was of restoration specifically in the Gulf Coast by Ducks Unlimited. And it was a great video. At the end, people were, I mean, I imagined, I like to imagine what they looked like at home falling out on the floor based on their descriptions in um, that they were typing out. It was a lot of exclamation points, a lot of all caps. I can't believe it worked. It really worked. And they need to do more of that. And people should give them money to do <laughs> So it was, it was really, um, it was, it was gratifying to know that um, if only I could change the world 30 people at a time in focus groups, that you could really show people how these solutions work. And so that was one of the key takeaways that we already know. Instagram is a success. TikTok's a success for a reason. People like videos. People like things that are short and quick and just give you the answer. Um, and then they show people and they show pretty things. So we knew the videos worked, and now we know videos with solutions really work in this context of genuinely changing someone's opinion. And you may think, well, that's also not groundbreaking. Um, I don't spend a lot of time on social media. So for me, it was really nice to see how, how you hope someone's opinion can be changed, how you hope you can inform someone. And, it, and they actually did take it in. Um, the other thing that we learned is that personal connections really make a difference. So having someone in the story, having people there that are real, that are doing the work, that are feeling the impacts, whatever it is, having that personal con personal connection helps someone see that this isn't some abstract concept. This is someone's life. There's some element of empathy there. There's some element of reality there. Um, so having that really made a difference. And my pollster told me no one really understands the word resilience. 
They don't get it, at least as far as nature is concerned. People understand that they have to be resilient, that they have to harden themselves, that they have to get stronger, and that that they do that sometimes through hardship. People don't really get it when it comes to nature. And I said, we just have to explain it to them. And she was right. So that's a takeaway. Uh, resilience in nature is hard to understand. I That doesn't mean I stop talking about it. it just means I have to explain it more. Um, but keep that in mind when you use your, your different words, how you communicate climate and how you communicate what's happening. Resilience is something that feels like an easy go-to word that matches your copy, that matches what you're thinking, and it might come across difficult to understand. So you have to give examples. Um, trusted parties. So we reinforced, and I would like you to know that um, state Fish and Wildlife Agencies ranked number three amongst trusted parties of who, they, who they're willing to accept information for about any type of science and most definitely climate science. So you have a really important outsized role in the climate conversation or in the, the habitat and um, wildlife conversation because people really, really trust you. They also trust farmers. They trust other sportsmen. Um, and and under official agencies, it was they they trust, let's say, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, they trust Forest Service, they don't trust the federal government. So keep in mind, individual agencies and official representatives, technical uh, assistance representatives, those are all really important people in the conversation. They're really important people in in moving people in the conversation and um, not the federal government. So that was fun. Next slide. Oh, and then I, I did have some animation. So I kind of spoke to this, that people enjoyed seeing the video. This was their end of, end of the uh, session feedback. And yeah, it worked, which was, was really great to see. I think there might be one more quote. Yeah. Ducks Unlimited is behind it all. It's making a difference. I think that might be it. The, you can go to the next one. So the other thing that we noticed, this is a conversation about climate change and hunters and anglers and climate change, but it's really important to note that um, our, our important spaces, our natural spaces are being threatened in other ways. And people saw nature, if they did see that nature was less resilient, again, that's a difficult topic to discuss and to understand. They weren't always connected to, to climate change because there's just so many other things happening. And you saw that a little bit in the data of what are the threats to, um, to fish and wildlife. So they're saying human traffic. So people are, you know, causing vegetation and wildlife to, to have issues that, and then they're less resilient because of warmer climates leading to droughts and pollution. But that same person wasn't able to make that connection to climate change. So like the droughts and the pollution and things are warmer, but that's not, you know, so we still have to like explain that that is, that is what climate change looks like for you in your region. And that's another one to con that we realized is a continual conversation of the, the planet is warming and it is causing climatic patterns to be different and change and so it will look different where you are. So it was a nice realization for us for how we talk about it. Um, and then industrialization. So people, do, their systems don't have the ability to recover because we're we're taking up the space and we have more people. Um, next slide, Jacob. So we also wanted to see that um, what like what might work in helping people understand that the climate is a threat um, and that might help them be motivated to act. And these were the, the messages of all the messages we tested, these were the, came, the ones that came back with the most positive feedback. So we need to take action to protect future generations quality of life and ensure that our children can enjoy outdoor traditions like fishing and hunting the same way we do. And then outdoor recreation like hunting, fishing, boating, and camping is a wonderful part of our way of life, it benefits our economy. So the economic message. And at the time it was $689 billion, but I think now it's like 862 is the most recent number. So 
the economic message or the um, the legacy message. Those were the two that that tested the the, the best and um, was able to people say that it would motivate them. Next slide. So I just wanted to touch for a minute on some of the ways that we're thinking about this at the partnership for opportunities. So we obviously have um, a heavy role in making sure to communicate to the community, to the sporting community about climate change and their role in um, solutions. We also have, we are a federal policy shop. So we work on federal policy and we work with agencies and with the bipartisan infrastructure law, and Inflation Reduction Act. You know all about these. I'm sure new funding was, was put out there for, for agencies to, um, to work with. And the ones you have up on your screen are probably not the ones you expected to see, most definitely not from the um, bipartisan infrastructure law. The ones that people are talking about um, from, the, from the context of fish and wildlife would obviously be in um, the department <laughs> interior. So why am I talking to you about the Department of Transportation? But I think that there's a real opportunity here for partnerships in new and different ways for current work that you're doing and or existing work, existing plans that you could be doing. Um, I th Because what is the crux of what fish and wildlife agencies are doing when you're talking about restoring a space or conserving a space, um, that work is a, is a solution if done right, if done in the right um, region, if done in the right way, um, and if done with the right partners can really be a sustainable, long lasting solution while other solutions, uh, more technical solutions are, are being identified and implemented. And these two, I just wanted to call out to the Department of Transportation within the bipartisan infrastructure law. They have PROTECT grants. It's a brand new program completely made up by um, the bipartisan infrastructure law. And within that grant program, there's formula funding. There's formula funding. It's it's a lot. Unfortunately, I, I didn't write down the note of exactly how much it is, but it is, um, it is a lot of formula funding. And what they're seeing, so the PROTECT grant program, first to note, uh, is an acronym, and it's really about having resilience in infrastructure, in highway infrastructure, um, but it specifically calls out the use of nature-based solutions and natural infrastructure in connection with the highway infrastructure. So there's an opportunity there to introduce nature-based solutions, to introduce natural infrastructure in ways in, that were not funded before, in ways that were not thought of before, and with partners that were not thought of before. So the Federal Highway Administration has formula funding, and they're seeing that not all states are using their formula funding. And that could be because they don't understand, because it's a new program, what to use it for, what to do with it. Um, if you have thoughts or questions, definitely reach out to me at TRCP. We can talk about how you could potentially partner with the Federal Highway Administration to not only use that formula funding, but also they have a competitive grant program that they've they've just put out. The NOFO is out and I believe it closes in August. Um, so that's an opportunity as well. And the way I see it is obviously the federal, it's, it's Federal Highway Administration money. And they can have partners. And if they want to partner with your agency at the state level to do some of the work that you're already doing uh, that is considered a nature-based solution or natural infrastructure, that's funding for the both of you to do work that you are already going to do and work that they needed to do. The other program that they have is a culvert uh, removal program. So lots of money there if you um, have those needs in your state. And then with the Inflation Reduction Act, EPA has climate pollution reduction grants, and those grants are also competitive. There is a partnership element, so I would recommend reaching out to your state EPA to see how, and I think it's the it's specifically the AIR group on how the work that you're doing is a nature-based solution and therefore cutting down so many different pollutants, carbon being one of them, and that is what they're doing when we talk about climate pollution reduction grants. It's focused on reducing greenhouse gases in the air 
and nature based solutions can be combined with some of the work that they're doing in the in the air group with an EPA. So that's a thought for everyone. Um, food for thought and happy to talk with you further on it. And then the last slide, I think, Jacob, or next to last. OK, so yeah, just to sum it up, there's lots to understand about how to communicate. We'll continue to do these polls and continue to update you on how they go and the further learnings that we get. But we do know that if you are solutions focused, if you tell personal stories and you focus on the co-benefits to water and wildlife in addition to the climate conversation, it makes it a lot easier. Everyone thinks about climate as a politicized conversation and really the space where you're already credible is an in to having the larger conversation. I think that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Give me a second to figure out what sure. buttons I need to push here. I'll just say there that the QR code, if you scan it, it takes you to our website or our website is just trcp.org uh, slash climate or slash nature-based solutions. Let me, I'll put that up for another minute so people can scan it. Thank you, Tiffany. That was very enlightening. I always feel like I learn so much anytime I interact with you. And so, you know, I think we all know that hunters and anglers are important constituents and stakeholders in fish and wildlife management. I think you've really demonstrated how important of a partner they will be in our efforts to uh, mitigate climate change as well as adapt. Uh, so we can, like you say, you know, ensure we have fish and wildlife for future generations. So um, we've got lots of time for questions. So give me a second. I will unmute folks. Okay, your microphones will now work. So, um, if anyone has a question, you should be able to raise your hand, or if you'd like, you can put them in the chat and I will read them out. I did promise Tiffany we'd be a, a fun and kind audience is a way to encourage her to do this, but I also said there'd probably be questions. I go ahead, Bobby Jones. You might need to come off mute. I don't hear you. There you go. I I hope I'm part of the fun crowd then. You <laughs> are. Th thanks. Thanks for the presentation. I was curious. You drew a lot of similarities where hunters and anglers were good representations of the American public. I was curious what you know stood out to you as the biggest differences um, when looking at that group as itself uh, opposed to the population as a whole. Mm. I would say the background that this group already has in the outdoors gives probably an easier into the conversation. Um, I think most people think of urban populations as ready to roll and talk about climate, um, as your polls might might suggest, because maybe they're also more more dim leaning. But I have plenty of people on my street who are not ready to have that conversation in an, and I'm in DC proper. Um, and it's because they're not getting outdoors. So I think it was a lot easier to to have that conversation with people who were spending a lot of time outside. Thanks, and, and I was just going to follow up. How did you establish whether people were uh, sportsmen and women? Did you just ask, you know, have you hunted or fished in the last five years or something along that line? And then um, how did you come up with the sample population? Yeah, so we we used our pollster um, New Bridge Strategies, which is a, a right of center organization that um, works with Pew on a lot of their Colorado River Western Focus stuff. So if you've seen um, a lot of those polls, you would have dealt with Newbridge strategy. And I completely relied on their knowledge and their the way that they they do this. I was like, you tell me what to do. But I'm pretty sure um, that it was within the past year and then the past three years, right? So there was like different tiers of of getting people on, um, and they had to do a lot to get the sample size because some of the western states. Like I, I think I said, we did the phone calls, we did the internet, um, cell phones, and landlines. People in the West 
are a lot more suspect to join things like this. Um, so, <laughs> so it took uh, quite a bit to get um, quite a bit of time to get the numbers as they were wrangling people up, but we were able to get people in every state. Cool, thank you so much. I'm sorry, I'm one of the people in the West. <laughs> I think it makes a wonderful culture. Any other questions for Tiffany? I don't see any in the chat, but go ahead, add them to the chat or raise your hand. Okay, there's one in the chat. I'll read it out loud. Uh, as is, oh wait, sorry, they're coming in quicker. Uh, I found it interesting that some people got so close to saying climate change was an issue for fish and wildlife, but won't go quite that far. Is that basically a psychological barrier bias that prevents people from admitting something that conflicts with their preconceived politicized ideas? One hundred percent, absolutely. It, it definitely is. Um, we saw some of those who were just so staunchly not moving from the position, no matter what you saw them kind of give on or add to the conversation. Um, and I think that that's okay. For a minute, it bothered me. It really did. It was like, why can't I get this person over to this side? I'm not going to have some mic drop, drop moment for some people. Uh, no one is. And really, a decision to 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 believe in something comes over time and it comes over and you, and sometimes you're there before you even realize you're there um, before you realize you made the decision so i think that rather than focusing on what percentage points were were there or changed in the conversation my takeaway was um this will take time and job security. I'll keep talking <laughs> about this and I'll keep talking about it in ways that resonate and ways that are important to the community. And someday that same female 45 to 54 in North Dakota will realize she believes in it or she's willing to say climate change. The lack of conversations dealing with false concept that human population growth. I just started reading out loud. I'm sorry, Jacob. Can be sustained <laughs> on limited resources. Yeah. yeah, I see that comment. There's another question at the bottom. Yeah. Is some of our strongest advocates, trusted parties, personal connections, are there any thoughts to incentivizing hunters and anglers to continue to be conservation stewards slash leaders? So are there any thoughts to incentivizing hunters and anglers to continue to be conservation stewards and leaders. Mm, incentivizing is a whole other, like, I don't have thoughts on that. I mean, I'm sure they would love to not have to pay for their permits or their license, but that's what we need them to do so that <laughs> we can keep these spaces in good working order. Um, I haven't thought of incentives, ways to incentivize them actually. Um, I think we've been like, let's crawl before we walk and before we run and figuring out, are they, are they with us and what can we say to them? Um, but I, I'm happy to think about it. So I'll do one last call for questions. And if there aren't any more, we can wrap up. You'll have 15 extra minutes back for you to do your regular scheduled jobs. Yeah, Sean, I see your hands up. Go for it. OK, hey, thanks a lot. A great presentation, uh, Tiffany. Uh, I, I can go down a whole lot of rabbit holes here, but I'll, I'll stick to a couple here. Um, when you mentioned the question about, um, you know, whether or not these folks think that climate change will affect their ability to hunt or fish, uh, and, and I was kind of interested to see that, you know, the no effect thing came up quite high. Mm. <laughs> um, and I'm kind of curious if like in future rounds of this, if there's a way, if you do more focus groups or whatever to dig, if that no effect means hunt or fish as I hunt and fish right now versus how I would in the future. So 
Um, for example, you know, for me, Pennsylvania fishing, well, maybe I don't fish for brook trout anymore. Maybe I fish for smallmouth bass 20 years from now. Um, you know, I'm diehard. I'll do it. I don't care what it is as long as I can mm. continue to do it. Mm. So I wonder if there, there's some of that in, in there as well. And let me see what the, the other question or, or, or observation that I have. Well, a couple of them. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about, um, you know, you see habitat um, loss uh, due to development, um, you know, you know, way above climate change in many respects. Um, but, you know, climate change will be dri driving a lot of future development as people get chased out of one area and have to, you know, rebuild something else somewhere else. And, um, you know, when habitat loss is already the biggest problem, uh, we need to save as much habitat as we can. So there's a lot of work there. And uh, the other thing just struck me pretty interestingly, um, you know, the, the 30 by 30 piece that was in there and the 76% uh, support, there was just a, a pre-proposal floated here in Pennsylvania that really met with major resistance <laughs> on creating a new refuge. Um, so the, I just, the, the timeliness of that was interesting, um, but just on, I don't know if it's just that one particular place or, or what, but uh, we had quite a bit of uh, opposition to that and it'll be interesting to see how they move forward with that. So, but again, thanks a lot. Great presentation. Yeah, thank you, Sean. That that makes me all think back to like a lot of times this is a communications problem and and or at least it's a lever that that having the conversation in different ways over and over again, you kind of have to keep doing that to get to what you want, right? So if you you want that refuge because you know you're going to need it because climate change is going to continue to to change our environment and change where we are living and change how we are living then explaining it to people like that's why this refuge is important it's it's one of those like you think oh chicken or the egg which one do i talk about you just talk about them both at the same time all the time um and and maybe they'll get it that that climate change is going to impact the way that they fish in the future um whether or not they continue to do it come hell or high water or low hot water um as it were unfortunately um or if it's that they have to to swap out different types of fish or that they have to not develop an area because that's the one last place where the fish that i love can live um it's it's kind of like those realizations i think if you can put weave those into messages that we might have some success in bringing those people along and those initiatives along those are all really great, like things that you called out, Sean. Uh, thanks, all. One more uh, positive spin for the uh, Christopher, who had talked about incentivizing. I think maybe we, uh, you know, we can start with just assuring people who are comfortable with hunting and fishing and climate change that it's okay to talk about it, that they won't face the opposition that I think many of them might fear. Uh, I, I think that might be a good incentive to encourage at least some of those early adopters <laughs> into feeling comfortable yeah. enough to talk about it. Yeah, and there's there's maybe also an argument for making certain hunters and anglers in your area, if if you find the ones that are, are willing to talk about it, um, because they are, you just have to make sure that you empower them and that the, Remember that they, you know, you've got a whole bunch of people over here, 72% of the population, and um, we're here to cover you. So it's a bit of that, like, I'm covering you, you're covering me, we're all doing it together, we're all in, we can all talk about it. Having champions talking about it incentivizes the others to talk about it. Like, it's, I think of, when you said incentivize, I immediately think of, like, farm bill money, because that's the world I live in on a regular <laughs> It's just, so maybe I didn't take the question perfectly <laughs> as intended, um, but I think you can get more hunters and anglers to continue to have conservation and steward be stewardship leaders and be champions in the climate conversation if they see other people doing it. And so we're trying to do that, that very thing. We're trying to put stories out there of people. We're trying to put stories out there of brands who are doing it. And then to Sue's point, I think it's an and world that you can say climate change 
and feel that there's going to be plenty of people behind you. And you might want to talk about the specific changes in climate that are being, that people are experiencing and are being, and then you eventually have to say being driven by climate change, you know, so like you eventually have to make that connection for people so that they aren't just kind of wondering like, why, why is this happening? Uh, I guess I don't have to worry about it because there's nothing to do. No, there's something that can be done. Um, so I think it's an and world soup, depending on your audience and where you are. I always used to say that, right, you need to talk about the climate impacts that are relevant to that person. And someone in Florida is going to be concerned about sea level rise, but they mm -hmm. won't be concerned about wildfires in the West and vice versa. And right. uh, Tiffany mentioned this, but I will tell you, the last couple of weeks, people in D.C. were talking about climate change. Buddy. It was hard to deny with wildfires in Canada being so big that the smoke was coming to D.C. And that is something that the people out West experience every year. It was yeah. the first time people on the East Coast were experiencing wildfire smoke from a fire hundreds of miles away. But just on the metro, I mean, you could just overhear conversations and people saying climate change. So um, it absolutely is those local impacts that I think get people's attention. And then connecting that back to what causes it is the changing climate. Fantastic. So I haven't, I see a few comments, but I haven't seen any more questions come in. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you again to Tiffany. Thank you to everyone who took the time to participate and uh, join us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, keep your eye out for more webinars. Nothing's scheduled yet, but I'm sure there'll be more in the future and I'll make sure people are aware of them. So thanks again to everyone. Yep. Thanks everyone. Thanks Jacob.